फ्रेंड्स नमस्कार गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू पुणे इंटरनेशनल सेंटर आई एम अभय वैद्य डायरेक्टर पी आई सी दिस इज आर एट लेक्चर इन दीरीज इंडिया एंड दर्ल्ड ग्रेट रिलीजन क्यूरेटेड बाय आर मेम्बर्स डॉक्टर लतिका पटाकर एंड सीनियर फेलो प्रोफेसर प्रदीप आपटे दिस लेक्चर सीरीज वॉज कंसिव्ड बाय पी आई सी वाइस प्रेसिडेंट डॉक्टर विजय केलकर टू अंडर स्कोर प्लोरालिजम which is one of the hallmarks of the indian civilization and the indian ethos we have had fascinating speakers and insightful talks on buddhism jainism christianity islam judaism and hinduism in this series so far today we are honored to have with us the eminent jurist justice rohingtan fali nariman who will present his talk on zoroastrianism through the ages chairing this session is anuaga one of the founders of pune international center our trustee and a former chairperson of thermax i would like to briefly mention that pune international center is a think tank which works in the areas of national security energy environment and climate change social innovation science technology innovation and national growth and economic reforms and urbanization i would now request anuaga to kindly introduce our guest and take the floor thank you ajay oh bhai sorry on behalf of pic i thank justice rointen nariman for accepting our invitation and it's a privilege for me to introduce him when pic asked me whose name i would suggest to speak on zoroastrianism i could only think of justice nariman let me tell you a little bit about him justice renton nariman did his schooling from cathedral school mumbai he graduated from the campus law center with a llb degree and did his llm at harvard he is the fifth person in 70 years of independence to be elevated from the bar to the bench as a judge of the supreme court of india in 2014 and retired in 2021 justice nariman has delivered many lectures on a variety of topics some of which include late shabaks nargolwala lecture on parsi law applicable to interfaith marriages Justice J S Verma's second memorial lecture on federalism, legislative relations between center and the states, C D Deshmukh memorial on great contemporaries Akbar, Suleiman, and Elizabeth the First, Nani Palkiwala lecture at Mumbai on guardian angel of fundamental rights, and many more, which are available on the YouTube. Justice Nariman has delivered landmark judgments in virtually every branch of law. In a constitu in constitutional law, his judgments striking down Section sixty six A of the Information Technology Act has been acknowledged as a classic judgment on freedom of speech. Equally, his judgment recognizing the fundamental right of privacy. has not only been acknowledged to be a classic but he has been declared as a hero of human rights world over by an organization known worldwide for commending the freedom of citizens in shaira banu's case while striking down the muslim law of triple talaq he resurrected the ground of manifest arbitrariness by which even legislation can be held to be invalid on the ground that it infringes upon inequality upon equality in the sphere of arbitration law his judgments are legion the arbitration act 1996 together with its amendments had received a setback in some earlier judgments of the supreme court but he has been able to put back on try track by his judgments so that the mechanism of arbitration of disputes outside the court system has now become attractive with arbitration awards largely being upheld by the courts he is regarded by many 
as the father of the insolvency and bankruptcy code, where his judgments are said to have benefited the nation by over 90,000 crores of rupees. Even in the sphere of criminal law, his judgment striking down the bail provision, namely section 45 of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002 is regarded as a landmark judgment. In other spheres also, such as telecom law, electricity law, patent and trademark law, his judgments are cited not only in India, but also abroad. He is a person regarded by the legal fraternity as the most outstanding judge of his generation. I have known Rointon for the last few years, and apart from all his professional achievements, Justice Nariman is passionate and has a deep knowledge about Western classical music. He is an avid reader and is interested in history, physics, literature, and science. He enjoys long nature walks and is a committed daily walker. He adores his grandchildren and runs to Delhi to see them. He could, we, I could go on and on about Rointon's achievements, but will not take any more time and request him to give his talk. Thanks, Rointon. Thank you so much, Anu. Good evening to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Zoroastrianism through the ages is a subject which is vast and deep. And I will do my best to give you whatever I can in the half an hour allotted to me. Zarathustra is the founder of the Zoroastrian faith. Now, when Zarathustra lived is itself a matter of dispute. Many believe he lived in 1000 BC and the Greeks in about 300 BC said that he existed some 6,000 years before them. So we have this huge span of 5,000 years within which he could have existed. However, fortunately for us, what we do have is his gathas, which are 238 hymns, which have come down to us exactly as he sang them. They were conned by rote by generations of priests and fortunately were in verse, which is why we have them almost as he sang them. What is interesting to note is that he not only sang them in the ancient days, but he sang them so that they would uncover eternal and universal truths, which would therefore be of great relevance even today. He emanates, as he says, as a Zotar, that is an Agni Hotri from the Rig Vedic religion. Now, Rigvedic Sanskrit, fortunately for us, is a language which scholars have managed to unravel. And as a result of Rigvedic Sanskrit, we are able to translate the Gathas themselves fairly accurately. I have, in fact, written a book called The Inner Faith, translating the Gathas. Now, Zoroaster appears on the world stage as a reformer. What is important to notice that the Rigvedic faith in which he was nurtured was a faith where nature was deified and certain human beings like Indra were also deified. He abjured all these divinities and stuck to an Ahura, that is a Lord, who he defined as Mazda or the great creator. Now, even though Ahura or Asura, as the appellation was in the Rig Veda, applied to Mitra and Varun, two of the gods of the moral order. He created Mazda for the first time and said that there is only one God. Now, how did he come to the conclusion that there is only one creator God who is self-existent and who we cannot conceive of? He came to this conclusion fundamentally by stating that he was the first to receive a revelation from this one God. So what was important was 
that he divided mankind into two groups and in his two famous sermons in the gathas tells us that at first ahura mazda or the lord mazda the great creator created twin spirits that is twin minds they were twin in the sense that they were exactly equal and this is of importance the only difference was that they since they were given moral choice one chose correctly and one did not choose correct as a result of which when they got together one furthered life and one destroyed life by evil so the origin of evil therefore in the gathas is very clearly the moral choice that was given to these twin spirits he goes on to tell us that it is important that we all choose a right we must choose like the good spirit and not choose like the evil spirit what is of importance therefore is that from the old tribal faith of doing exactly what your elders told you you were told to choose man and woman each for himself the moral path and this moral path he called the path of asha or the path of truth now truth is therefore the kernel of this horastian religion it is truth as we understand it and it is by following this path of truth that one ultimately reaches god so therefore we are told in the gathas that the first most important principle is this path of truth in a very interesting verse where zoroaster tells us that he has actually visualized or seen ahura mazda with his mind's eye something like arjun being given a special eye in the 11th chapter of the bhagavad gita to see way way beyond what a human being can see he tells us that the first thing that he saw was that god taught him how to live by the holy triad of good thoughts good words and good deeds and it is by living by this holy triad that one treads the path of truth and ultimately reaches what he called garo demand which is the zoroastrian heaven and it is there that every life therefore on earth ultimately lands up in the company of avra mazda now a couple of other gathic verses are interesting one is the very opening lines of the second of the ushtavad gatha which is ushta amma yamma ushta kamma chit which is happiness to him who gives happiness to whom so ever else the link between truth and happiness is then made in our most fundamental prayer which is called the ashem bahu prayer everybody is taught this prayer as the very first prayer which you learn it's a short and beautiful prayer of a few words in which it tells you that truth or the path of truth is good indeed it is the best it alone leads to happiness this is the link between treading the path of truth and happiness and then you are told that you must do or tread this path for its own sake this is what is most important don't do it because you are going to get something in heaven or because you fear hell or for any other reason but for the fact that it is intrinsically good to tread this path so this fundamental prayer outlines the most basic thing in zoroastrianism that it is by truth and truth alone that one is to lead one's life the second important prayer is what is called the yatha ahuvairyo prayer now this prayer is in three parts it first reemphasizes the path of truth by telling everybody that just as a person who is powerful such as a minister for example is able to wield power don't get taken in by him because the real person to emulate is not him but to emulate a person who treads the path of truth the second path tells you that 
it is important to do good deeds in this life for love of god for it is only then that you get mental gifts that are promised to you two of them are on earth devishi and utayuti which is that you will get a strength of character by treading this path of truth and utayuti which is that life will take on a completely different meaning as a result and apart from this what is important therefore to realize is that it is only by the path of doing good deeds that you reach god and that you get these mental gifts after you die of course you get two others which are ameritat which is that you become immortal and who urva which is that your spirit or your mind as it exists today becomes whole so that it is fit enough to coexist peaceably with everybody else the third path of yatha venyo is again very important in that it tells you specifically that if you help anybody in need and need is the widest it is only then that the lord will help you so with these two basic prayers the zoroastrian goes out into the world to do his daily work also interesting is what a child is told on its navjot navjot literally means new birth as a result of now accepting the religion or choosing the religion in persia a navjot took place at the age of 15 which was the age of majority so that one understood what was what was doing and that one actually accepted the religion for what it was the navjot prayer again is in three parts in three different languages the first part borrowed from what zoroaster himself said in the gathas the second part in the spoken language of the day in which evil now is fleshed out and you are told that as a zoroaster it is not merely enough to live by good thoughts good words good deeds it is also important not to interact with evil but to attempt to thwart evil to the extent possible and the various evils that are fleshed out therefore are many gods you shouldn't believe in many gods you should believe that there is only one creator god so you say we do not believe in too many devs we believe in one avra mazda you should you do not believe in persons who lie you do not believe in tyrants persons who oppress people when they are supposed to be ruling them most importantly you are a person who is not to be willfully blind or willfully deaf so if a situation arises where it requires your intervention you must not run away and it is things like this that you are told in the the second part in the third part you confess the faith and you say that i am a true worshipper of one god and a follower follower of the prophet zarathustra and there are four key words the key words being one that you will try and be a mediator among men is very important that you will put an end to quarrels you will of course follow the path of truth most importantly you will give of yourself and also that you will be non violent at all times you will always sheath your sword you will never use it so this is what a child is instructed to do on his or her navjot or new birth properly so called what is also put on the child is what is called the sadre and the kasti now the sadre is a white muslin kind of thing which has a small pocket in front which shows you that however much good you do the maximum you can do is to fill that little pocket so it tells you do as much as possible and be humble in the sight walk humbly in the sight of god the kasti is woven of 72 threads which symbolizes the yajashni which is the entire compilation of 72 chapters which include the gathas of zarathustra it is tied around twice so that finally 
you have a knot in front and a knot behind. The knot in front tells you there is one God. The knot behind tells you he is not visible, immediately visible. When it is tied thrice around you, it again symbolizes humatta, hukta, uvarsta, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. And the end of this yajashni, which is very important, which is called the colophon, tells everybody that there is only one path, that is the path of truth. All others are false paths. Now, having given you some basis for the religion and the entrance of young persons into the faith, it is important now to state that after Zarathustra died, some of the old Rigvedic divinities crept back, but this time as Yazatas or angels, not individual gods on their own. For example, Mitra, who was also called an Ahura or an Asura at that point of time, is taken back now as an angel. And there are Yashts or hymns of praise to Mitra and so on. It is important to realize that this ancient faith was the faith of three Persian empires which spanned some 1100 years. Now the first empire known or rather historically known to us, there were two others apparently before, but whose historicity is not doubted, are the Achaemenian, the Parthian followed by the Sasanian. The Achaemenian empire begins with Cyrus the Great, who all of you have heard of. It begins in roughly 550 BC. Cyrus the Great was a person who followed the faith, but was not a bigot. So what is important to notice that even though he conquered Babylon, he said, I am conquering it not in the name of my God, but I am giving you complete freedom to choose your own faith. In fact, the Cyrus Cylinder, something discovered in 1879, which is written in Akkadian, shows that he actually bowed to Marduk, who was the Babylonian god at the time. So he says, I have come here as a liberator. I have not come as a conqueror. And most importantly, the Jews who were enslaved by Nebuchadnezzar were not only set free, but he promised them that he would rebuild their temple, which had been destroyed. This promise was carried out at the time of Darius the Great, who's the ruler who followed his son Cambyses. And there are six to eight books of the Old Testament full of Persian history, which tell us all these deeds. Cyrus is the only one called anointed of the Lord in the Old Testament. No other person short of a Jewish prophet is called anointed of the Lord because of the great work that he did for the Jews. As a result, of course, the Jews then split into two groups. They, they became what is called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the old Jews who belonged to the old faith. It is important to note that Judaism had no real developed eschatology as to what is to happen to you after death. It is Persian eschatology that was then adopted by the Pharisees, that is the other group, which is that when you die, you have a kind of video playback of your entire life. You will choose or your own judgment faculty will choose as to where you go, which station you go to next. Either you go to hell, which is reformatory in Zoroastrianism, because you must choose a right for yourself. Or you go to heaven, which is where you hear what I would love to, uh, I mean, uh, attend, music, Garo Deman. It's, it's supposed to be a domain which is filled with joy and therefore music. Now, all this continues until there is a final cutoff day. And then there is a resurrection of all souls. Now, these ideas, which were Zoroastrian ideas, crept into Judaism through the Pharisee sect and then into Christianity and Islam. So we find that um, in the Achaemenian time, which was roughly a period of some 200 odd years, where the Jews were also under Achaemenian rule, Judaism was profoundly influenced by this ancient faith. We now come to the next great empire, which is the Parthian Empire. 
Now, in this empire, which also spanned about 450 years from about 224 BC to about 224 AD, you had a number of kings. And from their names, one can infer that they were great propagators of Mitra, who was, as I told you earlier, a Rigvedic divinity thrown over by Zarathustra, but a divinity who has now come back into the faith as a Yazata or an angel. So you have now a massive fight between the Romans and the Parthians with the Euphrates River remaining as the bulwark of the Persian Empire on the west side. The Romans were never allowed to cross into the east. And it's at the Battle of Karai in 53 BC that one of their triumvirs, a man called Crassus, who put down the Spartacus revolt and who was there along with Caesar and Pompey, was utterly defeated and Roman standards taken. This may have led to the Roman soldier now accepting Mitra as a god in the Roman pantheon. And indeed, Mitraism then vied with Christianity. Much later, of course, because Mitra became what was called Sol Invictus. Mitra is synonymous with the sun. It was a solar divinity. And you had, on the 25th of December, Mitra's birthday as a huge festival, just as Diwali is in this country. Now, when Christianity ultimately took over as the state religion in Rome, which was in the 300s after Constantine the Great. Somehow or the other, Mitra had to be replaced and festivals associating with Mitra had to be replaced. So we find Christmas, as a matter of fact, is something by which a Roman emperor replaced Mitra's birthday with Jesus's. You may take it that Jesus was not a winter baby. He was a summer baby because he was born, as the Gospels say, when shepherds tend their flocks by night. Another interesting facet of Zoroastrianism influencing Christianity is found in the opening chapter of St. Matthew, the Gospel according to St. Matthew. There were three Magi or Zoroastrian priests who came all the way from Persia. They followed a particular star. And they ultimately came and blessed baby Jesus in Bethlehem as being one of the three saviors that are expected in the Zoroastrian texts. In fact, long before Isaiah in the Farvandi Nyasht, you are told that there will be three persons, each of whom is named. Astvat Ereta, Ukshyat Ereta, and Sosios. Each one of these three will be persons who will come at different points in time when the world desperately needs a savior to come and reinstate righteousness. As a matter of fact, astvat ereta means a person who brings back righteousness. Ukshyat ereta is a person who makes righteousness wax. And socios is the last person who comes at the end of time. What is important about these three socials is that each is born of a virgin. So the virgin birth was spoken of much before in the Zoroastrian texts than it was in the Bible and ultimately, of course, as confirmed in the Quran. So we find all these interesting aspects of Zoroastrianism influencing these two great world religions. Now, apart from influencing these two great world religions, we also have the Zoroastrianism, which now comes with what we may call the Sasanian Empire. Now, the Sasanians are the third great Persian Empire. They begin with Adeshar Papakan, who was a priest himself, and end with Yazdegar III, who was finally defeated by the Arabs. This empire also spanned some 450 years. And it is at the time of this empire that you had various other faiths crop up in Persia. For example, at the time of Shapur I, a powerful ruler, the son of Adeshar Papagat, you had a prophet called Mani, 
and money was a prophet who believed in a kind of synthesis between Zoroastrian, Buddhist and Christian ideas. Indeed, he said he was a paraclete or a twin of Jesus as well as the Buddha. He believed in vegetarianism. He believed in celibacy. And he believed that everything that was of the spirit was good. And everything that was earthly was evil. In a, in a way, he turned Zoroastrianism on its head. He was tolerated for a while, but ultimately put to death under Behram the first, one of the other Sasanian rulers. Another prophet sprung up at the end, at the time of the great Noshirwane Adil, or Kushru the first. He was called Mazdak. And he was perhaps the first Bolshevik in history, because he preached communism, not only to the extent of giving away or having property in common, but having women, wives also in common. And he fell on his face pretty soon after his death and uh, his religion fell on its face and really didn't spread. Now, apart from these two faiths, you have another faith which cropped up, especially in the time of a ruler called Yazdegat II, who had a chief priest called Mehr Narse. Now, this one could call Zurvanism or younger Zoroastrianism. And why it is important to speak about this is that this gives an alternative worldview as to why there is evil. Oromazd or God is now supposed to be twin with Rehman or a full-blown devil. Both of them emanate from time. The difference between between them is that whereas Auramazd is all good and Areman is not, Auramazd is also omniscient. So that he knows that if he sets a trap for Areman, Areman can be defeated. And the trap was set by having a period of 12,000 years. So you had the first 3,000 years in which Auramazda contemplated his creation. The next 3,000 years in which he expels Areman by pronouncement of the great yatha over your prayer, where Rehman finds that he is stupefied. Then you have the third or Gumasisan period where everything is mixed, which is the period in which we live now, where Auramazda requires man in order to defeat Ariman. And finally, he knows through his omniscience that Ariman will finally disappear. Why it is important is that logically it gives one a reason as to how God cannot possibly be responsible for evil. You will remember that in the Gathas, God is indirectly responsible for evil because God gives every creature, that is every human creature, moral choice. In the younger Zoroastrianism, it is God who requires man in order to fight against evil. And some of the Pallavi texts tell us that when you ask, where have I come from and where am I going? The answer is, I have come from God. I am here in order to fight the evil spirit and I am going back to God. So, it is very interesting to note that either Zurvanism or younger Zoroastrianism gives an alternative to mankind logically, which number one involves him actively in attempting to fight evil. And also explains that, look, an all good God cannot possibly be responsible for it. One other interesting facet of this faith is, all of you must have heard that Parsis are referred to as fire worshippers. Now, this is partially true. The Atas Nyais, which is a prayer to fire, specifically calls fire the son of God. But fire in our religion is not the equivalent, let us say, of fire in Judaism, where it's a symbol of God. It's not a symbol of God at all. It is a symbol of truth. And the reason why one worships fire or worships through fire is to symbolize that man stands apart from the animal creation. If you are a human being, you may light a fire, you may kindle a fire and you may put it out. Fire here signifies conscience. 
So if you light it and you live by your conscience, only then can you be regarded as truly human. If you put the fire out, you are no better than any, any other animal who shies away from fire. So these are the various fundamentals of the faith which have come down to us through the ages. Of course, after the Arab conquest, we are now reduced to the few Parsis that there are here. And that is another tale in the sense that after Yazdegard III or the last emperor, we find that we were initially tolerated by the Umayyad Caliphs because there is a specific verse in the Quran, chapter 22, verse 17, which speaks of Magians, that is Zoroastrians, as Kitabias or persons of the book, therefore to be tolerated. But then when the Abbasid Caliphate started, it was found that there were zealots from our own community who said, no, we are like idolaters because we are fire worshippers and therefore should not be tolerated. So we went up into the mountains, then went into Hormuz. A lot of people, a, a lot of Zoroastrians at that point went uh, westwards as well, but got assimilated. But some of them came down from Hormuz to Dew and ultimately landed in Sanjan, which is how Zoroastrians landed in this country. And the rough period in which they landed is around, let's say, 880. Now, what is interesting is that there was a Yadav ruler in Sanjan. And the Yadav ruler apparently gave us permission to seek refuge here on five conditions. We had, of course, learned Sanskrit and therefore composed 16 Sanskrit shlokas, which we told the Brahmin priests, telling them that, they are, that our religion is somewhat like theirs and that we are really an offshoot of theirs. So ultimately, the Apocryphal story, unfortunately, it's a beautiful story about the bowl of milk and our chief priest putting sugar into it. It's not really historically correct. We were able to communicate. We communicated through these 16 shlokas. And ultimately, we were given permission to stay in this country on five conditions, as I told you. One of which was that you will marry only after sunset, which was the local custom. Your women will wear the sari. You will adopt the Gujarati language. And most importantly, you will not bear arms. Of course, the fifth condition was that you will tell us what your faith is about, which we did through those shlokas. So we continued quietly as farmers on our own until Emperor Akbar. And apparently Emperor Akbar in 1575 AD had built what was called the Ibadat Khana or the Council of World Religions in which every single faith was represented. And the Zoroastrian faith was represented by a Dastur called Dastur Mayarji Rana. Apparently, Mayarji Rana made such an impression on him that he wore the Sadra and the Kasti. And apart from having worn the Sadra and Kasti, also adopted not only the Zoroastrian rituals, such as a fire burning continuously at his court, but also the Zoroastrian calendar. So that in Mughal times, if you were to speak of something happening on a particular date, it would happen on Ma Farvandin Roj, let us say, Adar, which is exactly our calendar today. He also gave us vast lands. And as a result, the community started prospering and doing well. Ultimately, when the British came, we were the first to learn Western habits, Western manners, Western language, and therefore flourished under them as well. And today, the community is really at a crossroads because we find that this great faith, which was the faith of three huge Persian empires, now in a handful of Parsis, some of whom have emigrated abroad, is dwindling and liable to die out. The reason really is because in our law, a division bench of the Bombay High Court held. One of them was a Parsi gentleman, one judge, and the other an Englishman. Held that we were as caste ridden as our Hindu brethren. And that therefore, only if your father happens to be a Parsi, can you also be a Zoroastrian. So you require a dual qualification. Now, if your Parsi father if your Parsi paternity is established, fine. 
But if maternity alone is established and your father happens to be from another community, out you go. So there's a kind of double jeopardy because your mother usually brings you up. And Parsi women want to bring up their children as Parsis are, shut, are, are shown the door. And Parsi men who have their uh, children's navjots without their wives being admitted to Zoroastrianism, find, we find finally land up as uh, members of other communities and not Zoroastrians. So it's a great pity if this great faith were to die out due to the present law. Of course, there are constitutional challenges to it. And there are also movements such as Geo Parsi, etc., which I don't think are doing enough. And I only hope and pray that ultimately this great faith doesn't get snuffed out. Thank you all very much. I think my time is taken. Thank you very much, sir, for that very fascinating talk. Uh, with the permission of the chair, I would like to open the floor to questions that have come in from uh, the members of our audience. Uh, Mr. Yarman Wacha uh, sends you his greetings from Singapore. Yes, he is my very dear old friend. Yes. And sir, I would like to mention to you that uh, some months back we had Don Dungaji speak on uh, Sir Jamshedji Tata. And he made this point that uh, all the philanthropy of the Tata group uh, has come from this faith uh, in Zoroastrianism. And that was a fascinating talk we had, just as fascinating uh, insights we've had today in uh, your faith. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Tejas Dharkar. Uh, he asks that, um, is there any common between the one God concept of Abrahamic faiths and the Zoroastrianism? If there is, could you shed light on it, sir? Yes, certainly. You see, Yahweh, who is the Jewish God of the Abrahamic faiths, is also a creator God and a person who is self-existent like Ahura Mazda. So in a sense, you are speaking of the same God, though you have described him differently. Yahweh describes himself in the Bible as I am, which, which, which is enigmatic, but which tells you everything. Whereas Aura Mazda is described as the person who happens to be the great creator, who Yahweh also is. So there is no doubt that you are speaking of the same God. There's no doubt that the Christian God is the same God. There's no doubt that Allah is also the same God. I hope that answers the question. Wonderful. Uh, sir, Mr. Louis Miranda has a question. Uh, and he says, uh, it is fascinating to hear how Zoroastrianism has impacted Judaism and Christianity. Can you please suggest an easy to read book on the Zoroastrianism religion? Uh, my own. I can suggest two of my own books one of which is called The Inner Fire, which tells us about Zoroaster's hymns. And the second book, which is for private circulation, is in fact a book on Zoroastrianism in other faiths. Now you can tell him that both these books are online. And both of them can be tapped at a site called avesta.org. Yes, we will take note and... Uh... We have a small library at the PIC office in Pune, yes. and we will have these uh, books uh, in our library. Yes, I will be very happy to donate them. Mr. Jatinder Yakmi uh, wishes to ask, uh, how does Zoroastrianism help uh, Parsis like Zubin Mehta, J.R.D. Tata, Freddie Mercury, uh, the Godrejas, Soli Sorabji, Baba, Setna, Cyrus Punawala to shine like stars? Uh, difficult question. I'll tell you, according to me, Zoroastrianism's emphasis is not to shine as a star. The emphasis is to shine morally. Now, if while you are a star, you shine morally, then that's good. But if you are a star and you don't shine morally, then that's not Zoroastrian. So I would like to mention to our uh, members of the audience that many of uh, 
Justice Nariman stocks, one of them being on uh, the great uh, legal luminary Nani Palkiwala, are on YouTube. So you would like to have a look at them. There's an interesting one on reincarnation as well, which is the seventh Singhvi Memorial Lecture. People who are interested should see it. Mr. Ashok Vaidya says, uh, this is an outstanding and evocative lecture. Uh, what Vedic verses are in Avestha? He would like to know something about that. Uh, as I told you, the Avestha, in fact, Avestha is a sister language of Rig Vedic Sanskrit. Now, if I tell you the basic prayer, the Ashembau prayer, which I spoke about, you will realize that the language is identical, save and except for the expression her becoming sir. Ashem Bahu goes like this. Ashem Bahu Vahishtem Asti Usta Asti Usta Ammai Yad Asai Vahishtai Ashem. In Sanskrit, it is Asem Vasu Vasistem Asti Usta Asti Sem Usta Smyai Syad Asai Vasistai Ashem, meaning exactly the same thing. So, though the language is the same, the content of a Rigvedic verse and the verse of the Gathas is completely different. The content of a Rigvedic verse will be from some one of 414 spheres, each of whom contemplated and thought about various things which are unseen. Whereas Zoroaster tells you plainly that, look, what I am telling you is not from my own mind. It is revealed to me from an outside source. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, sir, uh, one of the curators of this series, uh, Dr. Latika Padgaonkar, uh, has a question. Uh, she wants to know what like the Zoroastrians uh, speak. You said they knew Sanskrit, but what language did they speak? Well, they spoke in five different languages. The early Zoroastrians spoke in Avesta, which is the sister of Rigvedic Sanskrit. Then the Zoroastrians of the Sasanian time spoke in Pahlavi, which was a completely different language. And then you, after Pahlavi, you had the language of the Dinkard and other religious texts, which one could call perhaps Middle Persian. And today, of course, the Zoroastrians in Persia speak Farsi, which is modern Persia. Mr. Sridhar Gopal Krishnan has a question. Uh, he wishes to know what were the social situations that led to Zoroaster conceiving the faith? The social situation that led to his conceiving the faith apparently was what is set out in chapter 29 of the Yajashni. Now that's a very interesting chapter because it says there is a conference in heaven. It is something like the Bhagavad Puran, chapter 10, and like Jeremiah, that there is a terrible time on earth. The soul of the cow is crying, Gau Survan, exactly like the soul of the cow was crying in the Bhagavad Puran and saying that I am surrounded by rapine, violence, this, that, and the other. For God's sake, send me a savior. And there's a conference in heaven where God speaks to the holy immortals. And ultimately, one of the immortals answers and says, yes, we do have somebody that we can send down and that somebody is Zarathustra. And finally, the agricultural community, which is the cow's soul, so to speak, says, what are you doing? You're sending me one, one ordinary human being when I've asked for somebody who's superhuman. But then finally, they realize that the ordinary human being is superhuman because he's given a revelation from outside. Suresh Desai has a question. Um, uh, this is about the status of women in Zoroastrianism during the times of the Persian Empire. So Sudesh wishes to know the, uh, and says that it seems women had an equal social status and were given great social and uh, were even great social and military leaders. Secondly, is it true that a 1900 year old Avastha has been found in Afghanistan? It's absolutely correct to say that women were given equal social status. As a matter of fact, 
You remember I spoke about the two great sermons of Zarathustra himself. In the second sermon, he specifically speaks of men and women. He doesn't leave out women. So when he speaks of men, he says na. When he speaks of a woman, he speaks of a gena, which is a woman. So from, right from the beginning, men and women, men and women were put on the same pedestal. Both can do good, both can do evil, and both ought to do good and fight evil. You go back only to morality. Sexually speaking, there is no difference between the two. As a matter of fact, in the very old days, women even became priests, which was a, an exclusive preserve of the male. And of course, in the later Sasanian period, when uh, the entire empire crumbled just before Yazdegat three, you had several queens who led. You had Puran Dukt, then you had Azarmin, etc., who were daughters of Kusru Parvez, who was the second Kusru. And so far as the Avesta being found in some other place, I have not the slightest idea. So it's amazing to know about the status of uh, women in uh, ancient. Uh, Persia and uh, in the Zoroastrianism faith, where uh, uh, women are treated on par with men, uh, yeah. it's extraordinary, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, sir, Mr. J. Narayan Swami wishes to know on the miracle power of food offered to the Lord under the Parsi faith, uh, as in the case of, say, Prasad in Hinduism. Now, according to us, in the faith, there is nothing about the miracle power of food. but as practiced, since we have adopted or we have now become like the Jews, adopted our faiths in the Achaemenian period, we have adopted a lot of Hindu customs. And some of the Hindu customs adopted are that you pray over fruits and then you say this is Banailu. As a result of which, this Banailu fruit is supposed to be eaten, which is supposed to give you some kind of, I mean, contact with what is upstairs. But I mean, these are all really matters of belief more than matters which belong to our faith. And of course, as I said, we have become Hinduized here. Right, right. External influences on a religion which uh, yeah. we have seen uh, happening in many other religions. Uh, many interesting questions coming in. Uh, uh, Firoz Padamji wishes to know. Uh, do we Zoroastrianisms believe in reincarnation? A very interesting question. There is no direct reference to reincarnation in any of the Abrahamic faiths or in Zoroastrianism. Nothing direct. As a matter of fact, you are told that from here you are going into another sphere. You are not coming back. There is only one verse in the Gathas, 49.11, which led to some debate. And that said that those who do evil will return to Drujo Deman. Now, Drujo Deman is not this earth. This earth is Ranyos Kareti, which is joy giving. It is not a place where somebody is punished. So, one very clear indicator is that you don't come back here except perhaps in the resurrection, which is after judgment. day. So to answer the question, no, there is no reincarnation in Zoroaster. Um, Imani Datar sir uh, asks, uh, can we start a study group called Friends of Zoroastrianism so that the faith remains alive? Ah, that's a very great idea. Nothing like it. Please do so. I will be very happy. We'll take off from here. Yeah, let's hope so. Very happy uh, with that. Let's hope so. Uh, yes, uh, and sir, uh, Latika Padgaukar uh, would like you to say a few words on UNESCO's Parzer project. UNESCO's Parzer project. Uh, Parzer project has been largely done by Mrs. Shernaz Kama, who's a very remarkable lady. She's in Delhi. She's a professor at the LSR. And she has started this almost entirely on her own. And the idea of this project appears to be 
to sell Zoroastrianism in every facet, which is not just the Zoroastrianism I was speaking of, but the Zoroastrianism of the Gara, for example, which is the Parsi type of sari, or the Zoroastrianism of food, the kind of food we eat, and the customs that we have, etc. It's a remarkable project. It really attempts to show the world what Zoroastrianism is all about. And it also has what I said is this geo-Parsi thing, which is that you are trying to fund young couples to produce more Zoroastrians so that the Parsi faith doesn't die out. I would like to present just one uh, last comment uh, before handing over the floor to our chair for the concluding remarks. And uh, this is the comment from Mr. Walai Singh. Uh, he says that this is the second lecture by you that he has heard. And uh, he really applauds your command over the religious history of Zoroastrianism. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I hand over the floor to you, Anu, for your concluding remarks, please. Thank you. Roynton, on behalf of uh, PIC, I would like to profusely thank you for a wonderful talk. I've been getting messages saying it's wonderful, it's very enlightening. We get to know so much about the religion through this talk. So I really appreciate. And I would like the audience to know that Roynton didn't have a scrap of paper in front of him. He knows the subject so well that he can speak about it without any help from any reading anything. So Renton, you have really enlightened us. And though I'm a Zoroastrian, I came to know a lot more through your talk. And thank you very much and hope to see you again at PIC. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Before, uh... I give the formal vote of thanks. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Kelkar, would you like to make any comment? Uh, 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 no, uh, no I, just to add my voice, I most sincere thanks to the uh, to Justice Nariman for absolutely fascinating lecture. And I also want to reiterate the request made by Anu that I hope we hope to see you more often at the PIC. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Justice Nariman, this has been a fascinating talk and we really thank you for taking the time out uh, for this lecture uh, in the Pune International Center series, India and the World's Great Religions. We also wish to thank uh, Anuaga for uh, helping us connect with you and uh, making this possible. Uh, you gave us deep insights into the Zoroastrianism faith, uh, as uh, our chair mentioned. And you spoke of the fundamental triad of good thoughts, good words, good deeds, not to interact with evil, but thwart evil. And the key words at Naujot uh, of uh, how uh, uh, Parsi should be a mediator, give of yourself and be nonviolent. You spoke of the influence of Zoroastrianism on the Abrahamic religions. And uh, it was so interesting to know about the uh, origins of this religion and uh, the fact that uh, uh, the ancient uh, Parsis uh, knew Sanskrit and that is the language in which they communicated with the king in uh, Gujarat. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the audience for their uh, wonderful questions which enriched our discussion. And I would like to thank uh, my backend team uh, Kiran Pardeshi and Amresh uh, Kesre for all the support that uh, they've extended for this program. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, good evening to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.